Hi, everybody. Tonight we're going to talk with Buzz Spector, and I have known Buzz a for while. a very long time, Paul. Hi, yeah, I don't know, but not since we were kids, but um, 30 years or more. Yeah, I would say 30 years. And you haven't changed a bit. What's the deal? Um, all right, so I've got all kinds of questions for you. Let's start off with the easy ones. Where were you born and raised? I'm, a, I'm born and raised in Chicago. And where did you go to college? Side. And uh, I did my undergraduate college at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. Yeah, and then post, I've been a graduate, you went to get an MFA or an MBA? A or hiatus more? for adult life and then back to graduate school at the University of Chicago. And what did you get? What kind of degree did you get there? I got a more or less conventional MFA, but the, the program was very unconventional, and I was studying uh, visual art, but also writing and philosophy. In fact, one of my teachers was Harold Rosenberg, uh, who uh, uh, everybody assumed was living in New York and right. writing about international art, but in fact, he had a he was a Hyde Park resident for much of his life. Yes, he wasn't out and about very much, was he? Uh, he he had his route. I, I know when I was his, one of his grad students, uh, I was the only kid in the class with a car. So I was his unofficial chauffeur. Wait a minute, when was this? In uh, the mid-70s. We call wow. those the process years. Oh, the process years. Um, all right, so how old were you when you, when you realized you were condemned, to, uh, when, you chose, when you knew you couldn't get away from being an artist? It happened really early, Paul. I mean, like grade school, and in, in single-digit grades? Yeah, probably before grade school. But, you know, one of the things that, that comes with being an artist is uh, uh, an epiphany that usually happens in childhood. And you might forget it. You might, you might totally lose track of that in your life and go on to other things. True. Uh, in my case, I, I had the enormous gift of, of that epiphany being shared with me by my mother, who was its agent. Sonny, you're going to be an artist. No, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> no. It was, uh, she took me to the beach. She took me to the Morse Avenue beach when yeah. I was four years old. And uh, I played on the beach and, and had this experience. Forgot it. Became an adult. In fact, became an artist who made work by tearing pages out of books. Right. Uh, to make sculpture. Uh, this was enormously distressing to my mother, uh, who, for whom books were sort of semi-sacred objects. And she was visiting my studio one day and saw a book on which I'd arranged little rows of pebbles and shells. And she said, you know, Buzzy, when you were four years old, I used to take you to the Morse Avenue Beach, and you would arrange little stones and shells just like that in the sand. And when she said that, it all came back to me, the most vivid memory. Of, of of organizing these little seashells and pebbles in the way that any child can be totally moved by discovering that the world is full of things that can be organized, can be arranged. So why did you go to art school? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I didn't go to art school. I went to college expecting to be a writer. And uh, I finished up my undergraduate uh, degree in design in Bucky Fuller's design program at uh, SIU. But you know, I was involved with words, though. Absolutely. And you know, and, and you know, and, and the, by extension, or the extension of all that. Um, all right. So how how much time was there between SIU and the University of Chicago? Uh, four years. And were you trying at that point to be an artist, or what were you doing in that four-year period of time? Uh, I was trying to stay out of trouble. Well, knowing you, that probably worked okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I lived in a couple of places and uh, uh, had some good years and some bad years. And uh, uh, There's not that many years. It's only four. <laughs> yeah. You can pack a lot of living into years in your 20s. Yeah, easily. Not like, not like my 60s where decades appear to pass unnoticed. <laughs> anyway, let's not go there. 
Um, <laughs> why did you go to the University of Chicago? And not as opposed to somewhere else, but why did you go to graduate school? Oh, I really wanted to go to the University of Chicago because I really wanted to study art and philosophy. I come to the conclusion that that what I was doing as an artist was an exercise in visual philosophy. And uh, I wanted to have conversations about that. So you knew that as a 25-year-old. So what? I was accepted at all the, the schools I applied to, but uh, every everybody was uh, my safe school except uh, U of C. Were, were you thinking about teaching when you enrolled at the University of Chicago? No, I, I really, I just wanted to, better know what I was talking about. And, and in fact, when I graduated, I immediately went to work for the University of Chicago Press as an editor. Okay. And of course, you know that that was an outgrowth of, of my editing this magazine as a grad student. You just happen to have one handy on the desk? Yes, that's what I like about webinars. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have show and tell. That's a good thing. Um, I was going to mention that. But all right, so you are, I, I want, I, I'll tell you where I'm going because I see this schism or unis, unification between teaching and art making. And I want, I want to explore that. This is the eighth iteration of a client artist works course that we have done. Initially, I sought to avoid artists who also taught because I felt like it was a fail-safe, you know, a fallback position. And since that time, I've come much more to realize that it isn't, it isn't only a steady source of income, that there are other things that it provides. And I've changed my position to being, you know, you shouldn't teach if that's not something you want. You shouldn't teach because you have to. Does that make sense? Yeah, or you shouldn't, you know, if you want to be an artist and not a teacher, you should be an artist and not a teacher. If doing both of them serves you, that's okay. Um, I have a problem with schools that hire adjunct faculty and don't treat them well enough, and artists take those positions without a constant salary, without enough money, without benefits, without health insurance, not tenure track, and without respect. So I want to know, you know, I want to look at the balance you've constructed between being a solid, highly reputed visual artist and an educator who's also highly reputed and done really well with that. And I want to know how you got to that, the, the mental process over time that got you to this place. All right. So that was where my leading questions were going. So I want to know a long and very involved question, and and, and I'm going to give give you a, a a long and somewhat involved answer. Go for it. We're talking about a a long period of time over which my own views about the value of teaching for myself as an artist evolved and changed. Uh, as I said, when I when I got my MFA, I I wasn't expecting to use it as a teaching credential. I I wanted to take part in a conversation about art and ideas, and I had done so. And I was editing a little magazine of artist writings, which uh, uh, I very deliberately kept from being an academic journal. This was White Walls. That was White Walls, and I'll more on that in a minute. Okay. But uh, I was out of school for several years before I, I taught a course, and uh, I was invited uh, to teach a course on fundamentals of graphic design at Columbia College by John Mulvaney, who was a great, great design educator there. And uh, I really took the course sort of to find out if I was interested in ever doing any teaching after that. And there were some, some really interesting conversations I had with students. Uh, you know, I was only 32 years old, so I, I was just a little older than them, and I was one of those underpaid adjunct artists you describe. Uh, but I, I liked being able to help young artists solve problems. After that, I. Where was I, that? Go ahead. Are you was at Columbia College, is that what you said? Yes. Okay. Uh, I actually never talked to Columbia again. That was my one and only experience. But the, the next year, I started teaching at the School of the Art Institute. Uh, and that's because I, I knew a lot about a subject that. Uh, 
many students there were interested in, and there, there wasn't really anybody else on the faculty at that time with uh, the knowledge base that I had, and that is artist books. I knew a lot about artists making books because those were the people I was publishing in White Walls. And I'd already started collecting artist books. I think at that time I had about 300 of them, and uh, now I have about 1,500 artist books from the entire modern history of the practice. And uh, each time I would teach that course, I'd find several students really would become ignited by it. They'd, they'd be excited. They'd start, they'd start working with some of these methods of generating relatively inexpensive, totally portable meaning on the cheap. And uh, after six years of, of teaching at the School of the Art Institute, I, I come really uh, to understand that it was somewhat inseparable from what I was doing as uh, the editor of an artist magazine. And and all these conversations were no, 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 no. You were making visual images all that time also. All that time. That's okay. right. And showing nationally and then internationally. So uh, I know a few years ago I was out in Los Angeles for a, a, a panel discussion at the College Art Association. And uh, they had a panel of artist deans, phenomenal small category, working artists who are deans of art schools. And I'm looking at this group of six artist deans, and, and, and I know that they have something else in common. They've also all been editors of art magazines. That's weird. It's, it's a, it's a, I, I, I think being, the, the work of being an editor, more so than the work of being an art critic, is a way of trying to inhabit someone else's being through a language that frames a view of their work. And that is precisely the problem. <laughs> it takes you away from your own head, your own aesthetic, and your own creation, or not? Well, I suppose if I were more of a narcissist, it would be a crisis. <laughs> I'm trying to be nice. Uh, <laughs> um, all right, but okay, so regardless, let's go to take the positive route here. You feel like these different endeavors are synergistic and help your art production. Yes. But, 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 like you, but, but okay. let, let me not misrepresent things. You know, since I started teaching full-time, I've had less time to do my work. And and I've had to wrestle with a problem that all teaching artists face, and you're well aware of this, but maybe not everybody in the webinar is. Uh, it, it puts you in the position of feeling like you need to be successful when you're in your studio. And, and this is a, a terrible problem. No, that happens for you. I don't think that happens for all artists who teach. Do you? Well, I, I can only speak for myself. I, 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 it, I feel that a, a day in the studio when I'm really experimenting is a successful day, but it won't necessarily result in successful work. Whereas when I, when I have to succeed, uh, any problems that arise have to be gotten rid of instead of examined and looked over and 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 I believe that you're at some risk of losing inspiration that way, losing ideas that might otherwise take root. I'm sure you're right. So what do you do about it? Accept it or do you do something to combat it combat it? Oh no, I I, I try to go with that flow. There's Expand what do you mean bad, I'm bad with pronouns? <laughs> with well, that you know, it's always about negotiating with materials. And sometimes the materials don't want to negotiate. Uh, often at, at that moment, you find out uh, other unexpected properties of your materials. Or you find that a rationale you've been crafting about what it is is in front of you doesn't fit the thing you've made. And, and in this sense, my experience as a teacher is uh, a certain benefit to me. Since my task 
when I'm in a studio mentoring a young artist is, is to get them to close that same gap. You know, the gap between what you intended and what everybody else sees. Um, as a visual artist, what's your priority? What, what's your goal? Your objective? Uh, that, that anything I make be visually appealing, uh, keep viewers looking at it for a while and then a while longer, and that uh, the consequence of that encounter be one that's remembered. Okay. What about you as the motivator of the art? What's your objective? I mean, you could say to make things that do that, but where I'm going is I'd like to be able to have, support myself on my art solely. I want to be in muse more museums. I want to be in this museum. I want to be in the history books. I want to change the course of art. Or you're, you're I want to be happy. You're actually symptoms of my hunger. <laughs> yeah. And, I, and I'm, I have to say, at, at my age, I, I'm not that hungry. Uh, many of the museums I wanted to be in as a young artist, I am in those museums. Uh, my, my work's in more than 100 museums. Uh, many of the, the, the things I yearned for people to write about my work have been written about my work. So, so at this point, I, I, I don't feel that I work to generate a future for myself. Artworks I made 30 years ago will be around in the future. But, but if, if, if I'm not around to know that I'm wrong about that, it's sort of a, an irrelevant issue. So most, of, so most of your art production is more private, or it's a dialogue between you and the art with the, anticip with the desire to bring others into it so that they may have a, a motivating, beneficial experience. Yeah, I, I make it for myself first, and it goes outward from there. Has that always been the case, that you made it for yourself first? Uh, no, when I was in art school, I, I, at first I made it for my teachers, but, but I, I got to be much better uh, as an artist when I did start paying attention to the work on my own terms. Right. I know when I, when I had my, my breakthrough as an artist, when I, I made the first artwork I felt was legitimately my creation, and, and I, I made it at home and brought it in to show uh, the teacher in my drawing class, and the first thing he asked me was, would you like to trade? <laughs> now, it's one thing to be praised. It's another thing to be coveted. Yeah, and, and you said no. Or you said yeah, yes. Of course I said no. <laughs> <laughs> you did? I did I say would, no. I would have said yes. You probably would have ended up with a gym nut or something. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so do you trade much? Uh, I do trade. I, I when do you trade. trade, do you think about relative equal value or do you just trade? No. Uh, there's two kinds of trading that I've done in my life as an artist, and, and one is with uh, uh, artist peers, and then we usually do work at, at finding some comparable value. And then uh, another category is, is trading. Come on, come on, come on. Do you discuss it? This piece is worth 3400 Do you have something similar? Or yeah, do you just exactly. the person says, That's right. It's really crass. Is it really? It's right to the money thing. It is? It's not like somebody gives it and they look it up? Or you look it up and then you say, I better find something of comparable value. Uh, come on. If it's, somebody I'm, if it's somebody I'm close enough to trade with, I'm already friends with them. I'll okay. accept their rationale for, for their work being worth 5000 or 3000 or 10000 Now, mm -hmm. the other category of work, and this is yes. is I trade with former students. And in that case, I give the more valuable work. And why do you do that? Because I, I learned a lesson from a teacher of mine. 
When I was in grad school, Ruth Duckworth was in her last year of teaching, and she she took a shine to one of my pencil drawings and said, would you like to trade? And I said, oh, gosh, of course. Ruth Duckworth was an internationally renowned ceramic artist, and I thought it was so great that she wanted to trade with me, and, and I would probably get a drawing or a teacup or something, you know. So I go to her studio, and it, what she offered me was one work from a shelf of key artworks from the whole history of her career, museum pieces. And I could hardly keep from crying. Oh, I would have <laughs> There was no way that, that my, my drawing was worth a 20th of the value of the art object she was showing me. And she said, I, I know that, but you're going to be a great artist someday. And I want you to remember this and give your work. I'm ready to cry just listening. <laughs> I love Ruth Duckworth. What a phenomenal artist and what a phenomenally humble, beautiful woman. Absolutely. And it's a cherished artwork in my collection to this day. Oh, my goodness, yeah. Um, wow. So are you still acquiring artist books? Yes, I, I am. And how do you how do you inventory and store these things? Very carefully. He, here's my newest one. This is uh, from the German collaborative team, uh, Stee and Schnack, and it looks like a bus schedule for Berlin. Yeah. But actually, it gives you the bus routes to 500 uh, death camps from the Nazi era. Where to see? the scenes of the Holocaust. So, so it masquerades as an innocent object, but the, the memory lane it takes you down is filled Ooh. with the sense of ashes. I had, I started collecting artist books and stopped because I had, the first one I bought, I think it was the first, was just too damn valuable. And that was, <laughs> so I, 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 I hid it in camouflage, Jasper Johns and Samuel Beckett. There's, oh, Fizzles and Foyrods. Yes, and I remember when I moved to Chicago, and I had, you know, I had, I, I wrapped it in plain brown paper, and left it on a, sh you know, on my desk. And I don't know how it happened, but when I was building my gallery, it disappeared. I'm certain somebody thought it was garbage and threw it away. I really. That's it was a really, really sad story. It's a, it's a really sad story. It was a beautiful publication, and. Yeah. You know, so, but I'm most, uh, uh, that's not a limited edition per se, is it? The book you're talking about, The Far Plan? No, no it's not limited edition. Are you doing, but, are you, you buying? Know, uh, but but good art doesn't have to be limited to be good. Of course not. But are you dealing in both, or is it most, is it more mass produced? I'm just curious. Oh, I, I have both kinds. I do have some one of a kind books that are pretty special. Are you head of the department there at Wa Wash U? Oh, it's worse than that. I'm the dean of the art school. Dean of the art school. And you accept yeah, that's why I'm interested in, in panel discussions among artist deans. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's probably wise to have you in webinars so you don't go after each other in the same room. Um, you took this position willfully? Uh, yes, I did. <laughs> I've always wanted to have some real input into the design of an art curriculum. And, and as a dean, I've been able to do that. And we have instituted a, a, a new curriculum which allows maximum flexibility for the young artists who are studying here. They can really design their own, their own uh, course towards a degree. And uh, it's, it's really changed the culture around this place. All right, well, let me ask you this. Part of the reason that I'm doing this course is because I feel many art schools do an insufficient job of teaching artists about strategy and having a career. They may do an okay job of teaching them how to make art. I'm not even convinced they do a good job of teaching them about the antecedents in their given aesthetic. Mm -hmm. um, I wish, sort of, that art schools were doing a better job so I didn't have to step in to do this. But on the other hand, I'm having a total blast doing this when I get to talk to people like you and Marty Margulies and Kenny Schachter and Jerry Saltz and Simone Dupiri. It's a blast. 
and I get to ask questions of people that I don't. I suspect they're not used to getting asked because I have the rationale of trying to educate folks. How good a job is your school doing about teaching artists how to have a career? We could do better, but uh, I spend a lot of time myself talking to students, both undergraduate and graduate, about career management issues. And our, our career services officer it comes on those critical sessions with me. I, I think she's she's upped her game. We we bring our students frequently uh, uh, on tours. And Chicago is our favorite location for us to bring groups of students to look at the art world in action. And we visit the art fairs, and we, we spend a lot of time uh, visiting artists in their studios to hear That's firsthand important. about particular career tracks. Very important to understand that uh, even though art is not a profession in, in any conventional sense, there are ways to be a better manager of your time and a better applier of your resources to creating space and time to work. I think that's totally true. And I think that people benefit by being able to extrapolate from others' experiences. Yeah. And, you know, the reason I ask about your nascent experiences of how you began and the speech, you know, more speech, um, because I think a lot of people have comparable, you know, somebody that they can look at and go, wow. You know, he did that. I wanted to ask you this question. I'm sorry, we're going way backwards. Where did you go to high school? Evanston High School. Okay. Class of uh, 66. Are there, are there people in your high school class that, that you still know that are involved in the arts? Yes. Who? All right. Charles Johnson. Okay, I don't know. No, because he, he, he switched arts. He's a writer. Oh, that's too bad. But okay. Chuck and I... We used to uh, draw the comic strip, Wonder Wild Kid, for the high school uh, newspaper. And uh, uh, he was the artist, and I wrote the dialogue. Uh, Chuck subsequently switched to being a writer, and he won a National Book Award in uh, 1993 for uh, uh, Middle Passage. He's a MacArthur Fellowship and winner, and he's, he's really done a lot of great writing over the years. Do you spend energy promoting your career now? Yes, I do. Like, what do you do? Uh, you know, I had a, a show recently of reconstructions of some of my, my book sculptures from the 80s, right. and uh, I sent that PDF to 150 curators, uh, many people who have shown my work in the past, but other people who whose programs, I think, uh, suggest uh, the likelihood they'd be interested in seeing this work. Oh, and when was the show and when was the, the mailing? It was last October at uh, Indiana University's Grinwald Gallery of Art. And uh, no, I, sent, I sent things out in February. Who created the publication? Oh, they, they, they produced it. And it, there's a paper version of it as well. And is it part of their normal program to produce this, or they did, it, did this because you cajoled them? Uh, no, I, I was only interested in the show if it came with, with that publication. I think this is a good point, because very many times artists ask me about, should I be in, should I be in this magazine? Should I let this book use my image? Should, this person wants to write an article about me. And the answer that I often give is, what can you do to seize this opportunity and magnify it? You know, how can you take this PDF and you know that they want to do for you, and what can you do with it? And with that in mind, what do you what do you think they should and shouldn't include in it? Um, all right, so you sent this out to a lot of people. What happened? Well, it's still happening. You know. I've had several interesting conversations about future projects as a consequence of it. And uh, since I sent it to 150 places, the fact that uh, I have three expressions of interest in future projects is that significant. I think it is indeed. Do you know on site? I mean, I talk a lot about relationships in this course and, you know, dealing with people to people. Do Would you know on site? What, what percentage of these people you sent this to would you know on site? Or more importantly, would they know you on site? Uh, 
I'm, I said almost entirely to people I've, I've either met or have had some kind of experience with over the years. Uh, and uh, I, I think that's really vital for, for young people. I wasn't adults. sure you were going to say that. And I was, you know, go, jumping into some shallow waters there if you were going. I don't know any of them. Um, which, you know, can work also, but I think less well. Right. Um, and so, you know, yeah, I'm pleased with your answer. Um, I have to say, though, did you, to some degree, uh, a conversation I had with you uh, reminded me of this. Many years ago, when you were still running your gallery, you, you pointed out to me how many young artists would come in with, with slides to show you, and it was clear they'd never been in the gallery. Oh, true. That's a pet peeve. Yeah, and, and they'd never been in the gallery, so, so and their work didn't look like any of the work you were showing. I, told, I mean, I, as a, I don't know if everybody in the course knows it, but I, I, I showed almost solely abstract art. And if there was something recognizable in it, I sort of said, no, I want to only show abstraction. You know, so that if people brought me, you know, portraiture and said, I think this is perfect for you, I was pretty sure they didn't know butkus about me. Um, so so it's, not about, it's not about sucking up, it, it, but it is about paying attention. See, our task as artists is, is to know our work. And if we know our work, then we, we are able to know where our work would make sense as part of someone else's program. Well said. And, yeah, and furthermore than not sucking up, it's also, I mean, I talk about building community and, you know, if, if you're sending it to somebody at another institution or museum or whatever, you have to anticipate that they're entitled to reciprocate and that maybe you can do something good for them. It isn't only about me, 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 it's about, you, me, you, me, us, us. Sure. Did you send the PDF by email, or did you did you send something physical and snail mail it? No, no, no. I, I sent I, I sent PDFs by by email, and uh, uh, and uh, in in many cases I I let the people know that I would be sending them the PDF. Right. Uh, uh, I, th there are print copies of the catalog, and some of those I, I send out, uh, especially to uh, museums or art centers or, or artists who have recently been sending me their publications. I, I love getting regular mail. I love getting people's books and catalogs in the mail, and, and I'll send something of mine to whoever wants to send work to me. I hear you. Let's open this up to questions from the artists in the group. You guys have any questions uh, of Buzz? I have one more question while you guys raise your hands. Is Buzz your given name? Well, the same people who named me Franklin nicknamed me Buzz. So I've had both names all along. And when I first started signing my pictures, Franklin, uh, too many of my friends said, hey, hey, who's this Franklin? <laughs> it's all Buzz now. OK. Um, you know, I got a. I was asked a question today, and I'm not 100% sure on what advice I would give, except that I would advise female artists to not necessarily take their ma married name as their professional name. But the question was raised by someone who has used her husband's name, and she's now divorced from this man and getting remarried, and you know, she, she's mostly professionally been using her ex-husband's name as her last name on her artwork, and she doesn't have any good emotional attachment to this man that, you know, she's divorced. Um, what do you do? Well, I, I hate to offer that sort of advice, but, but your professional name is durable in ways that a married name might not be. Right. So she's she's gonna have to decide for herself uh, how much uh, of the emotional crisis of nomenclature uh, should intrude into the presence of her name attached to her work, which is not about her marriage, which is about herself and her expression. But 
if all of her friends know her, uh, if her maiden name was Smith and they knew her as Mary Smith, and then she married, you know, Bill Putz, and then she went by Mary Putz, and now she's marrying, you know, Joe Sweetheart. But everybody, so her friends knew her as the artist Mary Putz. They'll still know the artist as Mary Putz, even though the friend is Mary X. Interesting. Okay. I don't think that's what I said, but I st I wasn't a hundred percent sure of my answer either. I went more with you know you 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 you're, we're dealing with relationships and relationships start with your core and then your friends and then grow out from there and maybe you should go with what your friends call you, you know call you. But my advice to younger artists, female artists who are not married, is to not change their name or not not change their name at least professionally. Yeah, I'd go with that. Michael, you got a comment or question? Go ahead. Yes, I do. Um, uh, thank you both for speaking with us. It was very enjoyable to hear you talk. Oh, and for sure. Getting back to um, your love of philosophy and editing and words and tying into this uh, previous discussion about names, could you talk about um, naming what you do? I think that one of the things I've been thinking a lot about lately is finding a way to name what I do as an artist and would like to hear you talk about how you approach naming your path. I mean, artist books were certainly done by other artists, but your work is different than just paint on canvas or making sculpture. So just like to hear you talk about that. Oh, okay. sure. That, that's really good, Michael. It, I, I think one of our important tasks as artists is is a, a kind of 25 words or less explanation of what we do. Not simply to uh, uh, give an elevator speech or satisfy a few minutes of some idle questioner's time, but so that we ourselves can organize our thoughts around an efficient and effective expression of the method. Uh, I stack things. I tear stuff up. That works pretty well for me. And, 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 and the funny part is uh, it was offered to me from some kid attending a lecture I'd given about my work. And he goes, so, so your art is tearing stuff up or stashing things? And I had to realize, yeah, basically. Yes, that's what I do. <laughs> and, and, I, and I may be a virtuoso paper tearer, but that's an invisible skill. Because in language, the word for what I do is tearing which suggests accident or vandalism or both. And, and I think it's the right starting point for a much more interesting conversation than saying, well, I, I work on paper. Right, right. No, I agree. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. That was, uh -huh. that was helpful. What's your opinion about Dave Hickey, Buzz? Well, <laughs> I think he's bullshitting, but... <laughs> He'd be the first to agree. You know, he uh, he's a wonderfully stylish writer, and and uh, uh, his his dismay with the art world is uh, somewhat like uh, how can I put it? I think the Texan duck protests too much. Oh, of course, but I mean, I, I remember hearing him talk uh, at maybe Pier, maybe ten years ago. Where he, he defined, you know, art making today as, you know, you get a master's degree in either stacking or piling, and <laughs> and, he, and he sort of concluded that that wasn't art making. And I feel like your, I was thinking about this earlier while we were talking. Your entree into the pileage and stackage predates, you know, it becoming trendy. And I don't know what else to say. <laughs> Well, thank you. Uh, it, it, I've been doing it for a long time, and uh, uh, I haven't lost interest in doing it. Uh, but the 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 issue that Dave raises isn't that a simple method is not worth calling art. Uh, Dave's concern is is the elaborate bullshit story attached to certain kinds of work like that. Oh yeah, which you're asked to read instead of looking at the art. And I will say that my work is not purely conceptual ever. There's always something worth looking at. No. He likes the sound of his own typewriter. 
And you know, and I, I don't know, it's air guitar. I think he did a you know, I think he did a good job. And elsewhere, less so. Um, I've been looking. This image has been um, boggling me a little bit. Can you see this piece of yours? Actual words of art. Actual words of art. How does one ship this? <laughs> very, very carefully. Do but they? That pile of yarn on the bottom is not glued. It's not attached to anything. And and the way I the way I uh, fix my work when it's been bounced around in shipping is I do this. <laughs> yeah. And I'll shake the frame until it's behaving like I want it to. And you think okay. it stops as soon as you ship it, or what? Oh, uh, I I always have to adjust it. it. Let's face it; it's work that needs to be, shall we say, tucked in. So I'm worried about when a museum has this piece and they let it sit for 50 years, and all of a sudden, all, all of a sudden, at the end of that period of time, you have a thick orange line at the bottom of the art. <laughs> I I I often provide instructions for the care and maintenance of my work. You mean like shake left two times, shake right once? <laughs> you know the, the 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 book I was telling you about earlier with the pebbles and shells. Uh, it's in the collection of the MCA, and and they've had it on view uh, several times over the last uh, few years. Uh, and every time they put it up in public view. Little kids discovered that if you hit the vitrine, all the pebbles and stones will fall off because they're they're not glued on. Now, curators hate that. So you were one of the first people to make interactive art. Yes, well, it's an unexpectedly interactive work, and uh, I, I I've done I I don't know that you've seen much of this, but you know I, I've worked with much more volatile organic materials. It's not all books. Uh, right. I once exhibited a thousand frozen roses as an artwork in a specially modified freezer cabinet. I didn't know that. Yeah. And and the organic material, uh, it's only temporary. I, I can't sell sure. that work. But it sure has attracted a lot of attention to my thinking about the ephemeral nature of, of the organic. And Some, sometimes you photograph your pieces or you, 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 I could pull up another picture, but you do a sculpture with the intent to photograph, where I believe the intent is to photograph it, and the photograph right. is the art more than the sculpture per se. That's right. Yeah, especially the stacking pieces uh, of components of my own library, where I, I photograph all the books in my library by or about Marcel Brodeur, so to say, or Dieter Roth. Uh, I think the, the best known image of that is all the books in my library by or about Anne Hamilton. But it's not simply piles of books. The arrangements end up adding content to, your under, to, the, to the work. And you don't exhibit those um, constructions? No, I just exhibit the photographs. Okay. Probably the, the best known piece of, of, of that sort of stacking is, is, is this one. Yeah, I was going to look for that. I didn't find it yet. Okay, that works pretty Can well. Can all you guys see this? They're all muted, but I'm going to nod for them. Yes. Okay, so this is my fiction. And, and I took all the novels and short story collections in my library and made a castle out of them and then changed into my reading clothes and climbed inside. <laughs> so that, that, that slightly pained expression on my face, is is because I've been crouching there for about 40 minutes while we adjusted the damn camera. So I'm in excruciating pain. <laughs> but let's face it, you do not get dressed to read. You get dressed to go out and look at art. I think I saw a, bu a bumper sticker somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> All right, C, your turn. Go ahead, C. Hi, Buzz. Thanks for being with us. Um, I have a question. I'm really interested in um, art that provokes a conversation. Um, and I know that some museums are, are integrating sort of an educational component to some of the artwork that's brought in. How do you, what's your thought about presenting artwork to a museum with that in mind? I think uh, the first conversation is the one the artist has with the museum. You you can you if if you're in this particularly opportune circumstance of a museum wishing to acquire a work of yours or 
borrow it for temporary display, the, that, that conversation was preceded by lots of research on their part, right? They'll come to your studio or to wherever the work can be seen and, and, and want you to talk about it because this is your opportunity to frame the terms of future conversations about the work that will be conducted on your behalf by people entrusted with the care of your work. So I, I think that uh, the, the value of a, of, a, of, a, of a museum education spins out of these initiating conversations with living artists. And it's a different matter when the docent takes you on a tour of medieval altarpieces, but, but certainly for, for contemporary experiences, when you're around to participate in that conversation, set the terms for it. So maybe you first come forth with the artwork on it just as it is, and then once you get the conversation going, provide that educational component as, as a perspective part of it. But yeah. I mean, to some degree, we don't know what the educational component is in our work. We say why we made something or how we made something, and uh, uh, I think a certain amount of, of uh, of what we do remains paradoxical to us, remains uh, elusive. Uh, and it's that elusiveness which I think fuels our continuing interest in making work. Thank you. Uh, I, love, I love hearing how uh, thoughtful and committed museum people talk about my work. I, I, I haven't ever had to sit through someone uh, representing my art in a museum context flagrantly mess with it. Uh, I've occasionally, seen that. occasionally newspaper critics do that. Yeah. Cool. Okay. See, thank you. Andrea. Hi there. Um, you mentioned uh, doing work in organic material and you said, oh, of course I can't sell those things, but they attract a lot of attention. Um, I'm really interested in that. So if you're working in materials that you can't sell, um, how do you nevertheless use that to your advantage to uh, get exposure and maybe still make a career? Okay. The, the classic example of this is Freeze Freud. I froze the complete works of Freud in two gigantic blocks of ice and exhibited the ice in a specially modified freezer cabinet. It was because otherwise the ice was so heavy it would have simply crushed the cabinet. So it, it cost me thousands of dollars to produce this work. And uh, it cannot be sold. But uh, in 1991, the year that I exhibited it, I applied for various fellowships <laughs> and grants and sent them the documentation I made of my, my Freud books on ice, and uh, every grant I applied for, I won. Oh, wow. And, and uh, a half a dozen museums have organized exhibits of my work, including recreations of that work since then, and it's been written about in maybe 20 books. So uh, it was well worth the investment. Why did you make the piece? Yeah. All right. I know this is going to sound completely lame, but I dreamed of it. Okay. And and it was so great. I woke up and wrote down the concept for the piece uh, on the pad I keep next to my bed. And I told my wife the next morning that I was going to make this piece. And her response was to laugh out loud. <laughs> You're an idiot. No one is ever going to buy this. I, I said, I don't care. I want to see it done. And And let me tell you, I had to do it several times to make it work, and it got expensive because, you know, the first time I put my Freud books in ice, I ruined them. And they were books I'd actually bought and read, you know, from my library. And so I realized that I needed to know more about ice. And I signed up at the Culinary Institute of America for a workshop on garde manger. So now I can carve a mermaid. I can carve a swan. You know, if you need something for a bar mitzvah, I can do that. But I also learned how to put my books in the ice so that they would not be destroyed. And uh, go ahead. Sorry. So, so you weren't 
so in a way, you just needed to find someone who was willing to exhibit it, and then you were self-funding this just to fulfill your own vision. Yes, first time out. Uh, since then, people have been willing to pay to help me realize these projects. Uh, my favorite one was a, a wall of butter, which uh, which smells great, let me tell you. And uh, uh, I exhibited uh, uh, 144 loaves of French bread dipped in roofing tar and tied with a mile of twine. And, and uh, uh, it was called L.A. Bread because of the La Brea pun inside that title. That's funny. This is cool. Thank you. I want to get away with projects like this. <laughs> Just sign your name, Buzz. Now you can totally get away wait, with that. Wait, wait, wait. I have to say, when I when I first started experimenting with uh, dipping bread into tar, I, I went to uh, you know Home Depot and bought some of that liquid goo yeah. that home contractors can use, and it was disgusting. And I realized I was going to have to convince somebody who actually ran a roofing business to let me carry loaves of French bread into the into the plant and dip them in a tar wagon. And the very first guy I went to had worked in a bakery. He thought it was a great idea. <laughs> oh, God. You know, this is a whole other story that I just have to dip into it for a second. But I think frequently... Not just nothing personal. Um, you know, good ideas come from bad ideas. <laughs> and I had a I had a gallery with a steel floor, and part of the reason I had a steel floor was that the gallery I had immediately before that had burned to the oh, ground, yeah. and I didn't want to have to, I didn't want to deal with that. But before I settled on, I don't know if you know the story, Buzz. Before I settled on steel, I called up a lead company. And I said, I would like you to deliver a truckload of molten lead. Can you pour it on my floor? And <laughs> they thought I was totally, totally nuts, you know. So then I, I decided I would try. I thought ice would be an ice floor in an art gallery. I thought it would be absolutely beautiful. Um, but then I thought it would be pretty cold in winter. Um, so then I went to tin, and then I went to copper. And finally, after all of those silly mistakes, I got the steel, and I think the steel was pretty fabulous. Um, all right, Stephen, you had a question. Go ahead. Hi, Buzz. Um, really enjoyed listening to you. Thank you so much for your oh, you talking about your work. Um, I went to a very small school with a, a very strong dean, uh, strong in you know in his artwork. Or he actually, it was an architecture school, but anyway. Um, it was it was really inspirational, but also at times it was problematic because he had such a strong personality. And I'm just curious how you feel about that and the relationship to your work and your students. I think it's a, a great resource to bring a strong personality to teaching. That said, it's it's not the best teaching when all your students' work looks like yours. And uh, I I I work really hard to pay attention to what my students are trying to say. And I, I, I believe you don't tell my former students by uh, the way they make their work. If, if there's some trace of my influence anywhere, it's in the way they think about their work, which is something else entirely. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Steve. Okay. okay. Jan, your turn. Hi, um, I have two questions, but they're kind of the same question, um, maybe with an infinite answer. Um, are there some publications you would recommend for an artist interested in art and philosophy, especially maybe along the lines of Eastern thought and the ephemeral? The other question is... is wait, 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 let's go, let's wait, let's get an answer for that one first. Okay. Uh, yeah, there's, there's lots of places to look. Uh, and, and it's especially good to look at, uh, at non-Western sources for that kind of writing. Uh, Yi Shu is a great uh, uh, Chinese uh, journal of uh, contemporary art. If you, if you haven't seen it, uh, it's really worth looking at. Uh, you know, the, the, the cluster of, of big money U.S.-based art magazines uh, really 
I, I don't feel as strongly driven to read them anymore as I did in the 80s, say. Uh, but there's a lot of international publications that are that are published in English that are give you a much wider frame of reference. I like art papers, which manages to survive as a regional-based uh, publication here. I think there's very good writing in Freeze, F R I E Z E. Uh, the French like one, the Chinese one. Uh, Yi Shu, Y I, Y I then S H U. Okay. Hmm. Thank you. Um, Go ahead. Another question, right? Yeah. yeah uh, well, my other question was, um, and here's my uh, 25 cent graduate school. Um, if you had the same inclination to go to USC as a young artist today, for the same reasons, but couldn't, uh, knowing what you know now, where might you start in uh, order to pursue some of the lessons you found you needed, being passionate about philosophy, writing, and and art making? A couple of books well, left. yes, no, that's good. And, 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 and here's how I'd go about it. Uh, you're not interested in philosophy as a kind of stew in which all philosophers are sort of blended into a big pot, right? You're interested in some philosophers, some writing about philosophy. Well, where are those people? If they're still alive, where are they teaching if they're teaching? Uh, go, go find the person or persons whose thinking has inspired you. Study with them. Uh, you know, the, the, the really expensive research universities uh, have lots of good faculty, but they don't have them all. There are good people throughout uh, academia and, and many people who are not academics who are willing to have a conversation with someone who has read their work or looked at their art and been moved by it. And, and I, I really think this going to the people who, whose, whose work has inspired you uh, can be a good thing. You good with that, Jim? I remember mm -hmm. when, I, when I went to uh, see a show of Anselm Kiefer's work at uh, the Marion Goodman Gallery in New York, and I, I read the the, the ads for the show and knew that it closed on a certain date and booked my ticket for the last week of the show and got to New York and went to the gallery and it was closed because they were shipping the show early to Documenta. And I, I, I said, but, but you know, you advertised that the show would be up this long and uh, I came here to see it. And you understand, I, I was broke then. It, it cost me a, a lot of money to fly to New York to see this show. And I was utterly bereft. They closed the door in my face. I just stood there in the hallway in a kind of shock. And, and then the gallery door opens and the woman who owned the gallery, Marion Goodman, looked out and she said, come on in. She made them unpack the show. No way. Said, yes. Marion is a total, total sweetheart, but that's amazing. Yes. No one can say any bad about Mary and Goodman after that. Three hours while the truck sat on 57th Street, they unpacked the books for me to look at. And I was not a famous artist in 1987, Paul. Uh, not in her book. <laughs> but, <you know. laughs> That's a beautiful story. I was reading about her today. She's getting old. It's too yeah. bad. Um, Jen, thanks. Ginny, your turn. Um. Thank you, Buzz. This has been really informative, but mostly um, how I feel about it is it's just nice to talk to somebody with so much, or to listen to somebody with so much authenticity. Um, the reason I just wanted to comment is I went, um, it was on a subject a little bit farther back. Um, I used my married name, and what I did. Um, is I started using my maiden name also for a time period. So my name was Ginny Wilson, and I started using Ginny Kruger Wilson for a time and then dropped off the Wilson. So I don't know if that would help the person that. Uh, yeah, that does. You know, it's not, just, it's not just something for for women artists. Uh, I, I can think of several male artists of, of my acquaintance who went through periods of changing their names for one reason or another. 
And uh, I can think of uh, artists like uh, Colette, uh, who, had, who went by one name for many years, but now, now exhibits as Colette Lumiere, so that people don't confuse her with the 19th century French writer anymore. Right. You know, there's, but, but if you're going to change your name when it's attached to a, a history of exhibits, you should manage it over time. Right. I, you know, right. The, with, with, with hindsight, it's great to think, oh, yeah, I should have always kept my maiden name. Yeah. But, but remember, I, I have several years' worth of drawings out there signed Franklin Spector before I decided once and for all it was going to be Buzz. So, so names are mutable. Our work is not. I think that's a good opinion, though, Jenny. Thank you. Um, Barry, did you have a question? Hi, Barry. Uh, I just, I, um, I've always enjoyed your work, Buzz. When I've seen it, I've seen very few in person, but a number online. Um, Thanks. I, I visited uh, during SGC a couple of years ago your department. And it's, it's really a great department. It's Thanks a lot. Totally unexpected uh, surprises. Very, very good faculty and nice facilities. Um, I just wondered if there's in, you know, Paul mentioned some of the conflicts he has about graduate school, and that's long past me, but it seems as though, uh, in my experience visiting teaching here and there over the years, that it's changed a little bit, and uh, a lot more um, emphasis is placed on theory over technique, at least in my experience, and it's, you know, a narrow one. But what is, is there a right balance between giving people, you don't want the school of Buzz Spector, but something that provides the right emphasis on execution as well as theory? Well, I, I, I've always felt that the, the best technique is invisible uh, because the, the function of technique is a kind of armature of consciousness that, that through which you see what the artist aspires to communicate. Uh, it, when people look at, at my books in ICE, no one thinks about the technique that allowed them to get there. But uh, I, I had to experiment with many different ways of inserting the books in the ice. Just like when you're making a painting, you have to experiment with your palette. Uh, it's, it's all about putting things together in the most fruitful way to uh, ignite an imagination. The, the play of theory versus technique is, is somewhat artificial. I, 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 there's a lot of art that uses deliberately de-skilled practices. Right. David Shrigley's work is all about uh, its crudeness of execution. But David Shrigley, the linguist, is pretty darn sophisticated. So there's a, a hidden technical armature there. When we look at Chuck Close, you know, the it is not the most interesting response to Chuck Close to feel, how did he do that? The, uh, there's all sorts of other things the work is concerned with. And and I think uh, it, it's, not, it's not the best thing for an artist to perfect a kind of extraordinary dexterity whose demonstration is all that there is to the art. It's better to take such dexterities as you have and put them in the service of, of a larger, expansive idea about what it is to live, what it is to encounter art in, in, in a society which always threatens to extinguish what's artful and beautiful in its citizens. Just one more question. Do you uh, recall a student of yours, Greg Nanny? Spell his last name. N-A-N-N-E-Y. He, he started Drive-By Press. Oh, yes. <laughs> He's good, I, that young man. I helped him start. I, I was teaching when he was at the UW um, in his local class. Oh, that's great. Yeah. yeah. Actually, they make nice books, too. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to see you next weekend at the next SGC. Well, a tip of the hat. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Barry. I think we've got one more question, and then we'll wrap it up. But we can ask more questions if you guys have got them, because Buzz is good and we like them. Um, John, go ahead. 
this is something that this is all kind of new to me when I'm thinking about being an artist and marketing art and all that sort of thing. And um, um, one of the, you know, there's a lot of artists that are very, very, very successful, and there's a lot of artists that obviously aren't. And um, I was sort of saying to myself, you know, how concerned should an artist be about uh, marketing as art and whether it's uh, well received? And I guess let me boil it down to the simplest question I can think of. <laughs> Is there such a thing as good art and bad art? And should someone who takes himself seriously as an artist be concerned about whether his art is good or not? That was not a simple question. Good luck, Buzz. Oh, Buzz, time out. I muted you somehow. Start over. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, well, I was I was going to say that uh, we mean for ourselves to make work that is good to us. Uh, I I I can't empathize with uh, with a hypothetical artist who who makes work that uh, he or she considers to be a bad example of one's own production. Uh, that that strikes me as a, a pointless exercise, and and uh, uh, you know it's 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 hard enough to take the work you think is good and put it into the public eye and, and have people uh, diss it or ignore it. Uh, it, it seems to me that uh, uh, among almost all the artists I've ever known, there was uh, a shared sense of the enormous difficulty of making really good work and and yet the enormous rewards of, of achieving it. So. So the energy in the studio to perfect one's craft, even if one's craft is a matter of pure language, uh, seems it's good for people's health. It's good for their sense of well-being. Uh, artists don't make a lot of money, but but artists often live lives filled with moments of joy and little epiphanies of of work that exceeds even your ambitions for it. At least in the site of its birth in your studio. So, the, so, so John's question about an, an artist who, who would make bad work and send it out there strikes me as the, the, the very definition of a, of a hack artist, uh, not committed at all to anything but uh, uh, a certain kind of public exchange. Cool. Um, Diane has a question. Let's go to Diane. Let me think. Here's our, go ahead, Diane. That's not really a question. It's a comment on the name again. Okay. It's the name of a woman artist. And uh, when I got my MFA and began being an artist, I had my first husband's name. And then I remarried and I had my second husband's name, but I did not use it because it was in the mid-70s when women artists were choosing their own names, no matter who they were married to. And um, so I didn't want either the first or the second. I wanted my own. And the way women artists were selecting their names were, was really by location, like Judy Chicago and Nancy New York and Wanda West Coast and um, Muriel Magenta. And I went through all my last names, or just all of them, places I would be living, and decided that I would take destiny because my destination was unknown. I think Diane Destiny is a great artist's name. <laughs> Very good to me. <laughs> Very good to me. Cool. All right. Hey, Buzz, you've been really, really wonderful, and I think we should wrap this up. Let me think. I don't see any more questions. Um, one, of the, I think you've been really informative, and you've shared a lot of insights, and you, you, you've used big words well, and um, I like that. I like that. Um, and one person commented to me that 
you are their favorite presenter yet in this course. And, you know, we've had some, I think, really wonderful people. And for you to stand out is indicative of the contribution that you have shared with us tonight. So uh, I'm, I'm very grateful. Let me unmute of all of us and we'll see if everybody agrees. Buzz, thank you very much, everybody. Appreciate it. Buzz. Thank you very much. Yay.